Through the years 1845 and 1846, Marx and Engels would write a set of manuscripts. These manuscripts would later become the German ideology. This manuscript would end up becoming arguably the very first real concrete Marxist work. At the time of writing, Europe was undergoing some extremely radical shifts, with the German revolutions of 1848 and 1849 truly materializing. Yet just years prior, emerging was another revolution, a revolution within the framework of philosophy and theory. This newer philosophical revolution spawned from Hegel, was then truly spearheaded by the young Hegelians afterwards, people like Ludwig Feuerbach, Hugo Bauer, and Max Stirner. Immediately, Marx and Engels take an extremely aggressive approach to the young Hegelians, claiming that this new German philosophy existed in pure thought, away from any material referent. Marx and Engels wanted to create an analytic that flipped this German idealism on its head into a realm of material analysis, an analysis that, to Marx and Engels, consisted of something much more scientific. The German ideology serves as one of the true, concrete beginnings of Marxism, a new emergence of dialectical and historical materialism, a way of analyzing social relations, history, and the world around us, an analytic that permanently alters the future course of emancipatory politics. As stated earlier, the German ideology was initially a set of manuscripts, with part one being the most complete and commonly referenced, and part two and three being relatively jumbled and oddly was even written by hand from other individuals. Because of this, we can cover these topics in another video, but for this video, we will focus purely on part one, as this is what is usually referenced by the German ideology. These manuscripts would come to play a foundational role in the development of Marxist theory. For that, and the German ideology's impact on modern philosophy at large, I'm excited to bring this to you all. This is the German ideology, just in video form. Marx and Engels immediately start out with what they believe to be the illusions of the German ideology, of German idealism, the very idealism of the late Hegel. Marx and Engels employed the dialectical method of Hegel, but became increasingly disillusioned with the very inconcrete political philosophy and historical claims found in the elements of the philosophy of right. But to Marx and Engels, with the young Hegelians, there was not any continual forward thought, a rupture from the prior ideas of the past. There wasn't a fundamental change with young Hegelians. Rather, it was just repackaged Hegelian thought. The change Marx and Engels thought was necessary was to move Hegel's philosophy around alienation, the community, individual identity outside of pure thought and into the material around us and the material social relations that was concretely interacted with. Hegel, along with his later scholars, viewed consciousness as something concretely separate from material. From this, Marx and Engels find this to be a mistake. It's very much connected. Consciousness develops from material, production, organization, and labor. This is the concrete creation of philosophical materialism. Here, Marx and Engels concretely center their idea of consciousness, of being human, with this. The writing of history must always set out from these natural bases and their modification in the course of history through the action of men. Men can be distinguished from animals by consciousness, by religion or anything else you like. They themselves begin to distinguish themselves from animals as soon as they begin to produce their means of subsistence, a step which is conditioned by their physical organization. By producing their means of subsistence, men are indirectly producing their actual material life. The way in which men produce their means of subsistence depends first of all on the nature of the actual means of subsistence they find in existence and have to reproduce. This mode of production must not be considered simply as being the production of the physical existence of the individuals, rather it is a definite form of activity of these individuals, a definite form of expressing their life, a definite mode of life on their part. There is a lot here. We can address the larger huge misunderstanding of Marxism being something that ignores the individual, but that's not the case, it's quite the opposite. To Marx, the individual exists within social organization we can only be recognized as such. Like Hegel's dialectic of recognition, Marx and Engels find individual recognition by the labor process and material interaction. Thus, something totally interconnected, something that posits our individual humanity is this very material way we produce and organize. Therefore, humane conditions, a quality material life is necessary for everyone as to ensure this forward movement of humanity. 
But this materialism and material referent is also the driving indicator of history itself. Marx and Engels claim that for history to move forward, the core conditions to live must be present. And the content for the history moving forward is dictated on these very material conditions themselves. To Marx and Engels, there are three fundamental driving circumstances that drive historical development. The first is that, as hinted earlier, people must be in a very state to be able to live, to contribute. The second is that from the grounds of one's ability to live, we find this creates new needs. With the production of new needs, Marx and Engels claim this is the first true historical act. With the third circumstance of historical development being that humans begin to make other men, create families, organization, and social relations. This process of history takes the process the young Hegelians employed, that of history being a dialectic of consciousness moving forward. The form of this historical interpretation isn't completely lost, they rather clarify on the content itself. The content being the true baseline of historical development, that being rooted in material, the environment and social relations, not of abstract consciousness on its own. Further, there are some larger takeaways from this analysis of history, one that flips prior notions on its head. That being human cooperation is our universal marking. The process of human flourishing doesn't happen with external antagonistic competition, things seen like in market competition, but of a world where humans cooperate and work to satisfy their needs. Marx and Engels say more on this here. It follows from this that a certain mode of production or industrial stage is always combined with a certain mode of cooperation or social stage, and this mode of cooperation is itself a productive force. Further, that the multitude of productive forces accessible to men determines the nature of society. Hence, that the history of humanity must always be studied and treated in relation to the history of industry and exchange. But it is also clear how in Germany it is impossible to write this sort of history because the Germans lack not only the necessary power of comprehension and the material, but also the evidence of their senses. For across the Rhine, you cannot have any experience of these things since history has stopped happening. Thus, it is quite obvious from the start that there exists a materialistic connection of men with one another, which is determined by their needs and their mode of production, which is as old as men themselves. There are fairly universal conclusions that can come from this analytic. First, in newer social orders, we shouldn't strive for stringent competition and separation. Second, the world and how it descriptively operates isn't from pure competition, but cooperation. Just under current economic context, this production and cooperation is weaponized in a competitive economic sense. Thus, if our natural human state is cooperation, we are living in an artificial and a harmonious system where our current economic situation is one of artificiality based on antagonistic competition. This moves us into ideology, where we see the historical and material referent for emerging ideology, that coming from town and country, to the division of labor. To Marx and Engels, this division of labor is the newer industrial practices of smaller specified jobs for individuals, often materially referenced in real life as being a line factory worker with a repetitive, specified job. But the consequence of this newly created labor process is detrimental to Marx and Engels, not necessarily because material factory work on its own is bad, but the larger social consequences of this new labor process has destroyed some of the most presciently universal components of our humanity. It divides workers, divides common people, and creates needless workplace antagonisms. It alienates us from the process of true creation and ownership. We become manipulated cogs in a machine process where we do not own the outcome. This kills what Marx and Engels calls our species essence, the ability to be creative, to live in a meaningful life. This is also where Marx and Engels find the process of true alienation and where they find difference in Hegel's idea of alienation itself. Something truly evident in the new industrial process, the very new process of labor. Hegel along with the young Hegelians with some minor variations find alienation as a sense of subjective, meaningless, existential anxiety. Not at home, an alien feeling around the self and a separation from the world. From here, through the process of self-discovery, we can overcome this and conclude that this alien separation from the world isn't truly so. That the world and ourselves aren't truly separate. To Marx and Engels, they carry this concern in form of alienation from Hegel, but argue it can be more materially referenced through the labor process. 
of a feeling of inhumanity from tedious, meaningless work, of a lack of ownership, of losing creativity. To Marx and Engels, this is the result of the division of labor and something that created a universal crisis that must be addressed for humanity to thrive and move forward. But this new ideological tonality moves further. It moves us into the actual concrete socioeconomic separation, the relatively newer divide of town and country at the time of emerging industrial capitalism. Marx and Engels explain the process of this divide from late feudalism to early capitalism, from the process of serfs moving into trade guilds within the city and merchants facilitating larger trade between towns. But we see through time the inner towns and their manufacturing ended up outpacing the country and rural communities. Thus, there is a dual antagonism that hurts both. But here is the important dialogue on ideology, everything about the division of labor, and town and country is the material referent to current ideology. It is the very material reason for ideology itself. But here is where we get to the actual ideological commentary. Marx and Engels are claiming that ideology is established through history and material interaction. It's not something we purely think, but it's something we concretely do as well despite potential objections. In the past, feudalism created a master-slave relationship of serf and lord. This ideological structure moved into capitalism, with the capitalist and the worker, which formed the larger separation of town and country, where the manufacturing of the town subjected the country to a slave-like economic relationship. Ideology is the material process of doing, and concrete interactions and relationships. And, at the time of writing the German ideology, the prevailing ideology is of a history of master-slave relationships and dual antagonism that hurts the unified nature of what makes us human. We see this with the division of labor, and we see this with town and country. As the current ideology is usually posited from the powerful class, as to legitimize the material state of things, creating what Marx and Engels call false consciousness. This is the function of ideology, and Marx and Engels' view of it can be summed up with this. The ruling ideas are nothing more than the ideal expression of the dominant material relationships, the dominant material relationships grasped as ideas. Hence, of the relationships which make the one class the ruling one, therefore the ideas of its dominance. This entire book thus far has been an elaboration on the interconnectedness of the world and social systems at large. Our prior existing empirical form of looking at the world involved things that were isolated. Government does government things, and economics does economic things. To Marx and Engels, examining social structures in isolation is totally incorrect. And luckily, in many ways, Hegel paved the way for a dialectical, connected way of viewing the world. But in traditional fashion, within the German ideology, it still falls short to them. The Hegelian interconnected lens still existed too much as pure thought. Rather, they claim this can be viewed more concretely through the social structures at play. This brings us to the relation of state and law to property. This section offers some of the first insights into Marx and Engels' analysis of the political economy, a field of study that emerged in the 18th century as to understand the relation to production, property, with government and law, with its total intersected nature. Marx and Engels claim that the political economy gives us massive answers on ideology, on trajectory of production. And at the time of writing the German ideology, economic development and industrial capitalism was moving fast. Thus, we see some of the most significant analysis on how capitalism operates, an analysis that is still regrettably holding up today. Here there is a direct intersection between production, trade, and government, and the ultimate concrete material reality shows that the state serves as a facilitator of whatever mainstream mode of production that exists, whether that be in feudal society or in modern capitalism. To Marx and Engels, the prior approach to the state purely impacting commerce is wrong. There is a dialectic in play, that through the process and accumulation of capital, capital, commerce, and trade actually influences the state, not the other way around like typically stated. Even today, we usually think of this relationship in reverse. Along with state apparatuses and its current relationship with commerce, this brings us into the newer conception of private property, which has, through history, also undergone a process, through tribal property, feudal lands, capital, etc., all the way to the time of this writing, what Marx and Engels called pure private property. Through this historical process, property itself has become abstracted from original social communal relationship. 
Private property as it now exists enters a singular unconnected antagonism with the community. And through this process of accumulation, the bourgeoisie own more and more and more to the point that the entire order of capitalism falls apart. With the state, whom isn't truly separate from capital, enforces this new same cycle. Marx and Engels call this reinforcement the political form of law. Law has to uphold the cycle and mode of property ownership. They also take aim at the idea that property, as stated by prior theorists such as Locke, is the expression of the general will. As we stated earlier, this property is abstracted. Our new system of property operates as truly separate from the community. Yet in reality, it doesn't actually work like that. It cannot. Everything is interconnected and requires input and outputs from other people, despite property being owned by one person. Thus, this creates a contradiction, an ironic contradiction that makes the complete community poor in the end as the bourgeoisie as the larger class ends up sucking up resources in a capitalist system. Our failure to account for this new phenomenon also reinforces new alienation, an alienation that kills self-worth, esteem, ownership, and creation, because current philosophy is now structured from the viewpoint that we are not material, organic beings, but specters, ghosts that conceptually live in the atmosphere. Marx and Engels claim that property and the state Labor now exists outside of ourselves in modern capitalism and the philosophy that reinforces it. Marx and Engels immediately start out by claiming that the new movements, movements towards communism, were and will be unique compared to other revolutionary turning points in history. That a new system past capitalism, namely communism, is the system that, for the first time, can really address alienation, brutal conditions, and a historical nature of repeated war and conquest and in many ways, addressing issues that were present prior to the formation of capitalism. Rather than a future system bent on mere reason, abstract ideals, it should be centered on material relationships and concrete exchanges. This is where communism massively differs. Marx and Engels elaborate on this here. Communism differs from all previous movements in that it overturns the basis of all earlier relations of production and intercourse, and for the first time consciously treats all natural premises as the creatures of hetherto existing men, strips them of their natural character and subjugates them to the power of the united individuals. Its organization is, therefore, essentially economic, the material production of the conditions of this unity. It turns existing conditions into conditions of unity. The reality which communism is creating is precisely the true basis for rendering it impossible that anything should exist independently of individuals insofar as reality is only a product of the preceding intercourse of individuals themselves. Thus the communists in practice treat the conditions created up to now by production and intercourse as inorganic conditions without, however, imagining that it was the plan or the destiny of previous generations to give them material, and without believing that these conditions were inorganic for the individuals creating them. The difference between the individual as a person and what is accidental to him is not conceptual difference, but an historical fact. Marx and Engels talk about history thus far as something that has been considered organic and of natural order. Yet, they point out, only in retrospect does it seem organic. Relations for quite some time has been dictated on an order of class conflict, with the upper class usually winning that war. When we truly examine relations, we understand the rather inorganic nature of much of our social relations of the past, and of the artificial construction of it via a bourgeoisie class itself. Therefore, it is the future in which we can attempt to create a more cohesive, fruitful, humane world that future, to Marx and Engels, is held within the communist movement. What is important here is that capitalism works in contradictions. It emancipates through immediate control of property, yet strips commons from citizens. It frees immediate tribal and certain religious ties, then alienates what it means to be human, of creation, of imprint. From this, we have established the process of humanity, social structures, relies on a process of material interaction, Thus, communism is arguably the first revolutionary movement that seeks to change this fundamental order of interaction and exchange. Here it must be noted, Marx and Engels are not negating the individual, like typically stated. Rather, they take an opposite approach. Only through engagement with the community, human interaction, cooperation, can we actually recognize our forms of individual humanity itself. The form of dialectics have not been lost. 
Marx and Engels use dialectics in a material context to show how we recognize ourselves through the community, the contradictions in property, etc. And most of all, dialectics show us that capitalism continually falls on its head and creates its own demise. It divides workers, it even sucks up competition, and even the bourgeoisie will grow smaller and smaller through corporate trust, only to break every 10 years. This is the process of big industry. At the end of the book, Marx and Engels summarize with these conclusions. The first is, the division of labor and capitalism at large by default show that workers are unnecessarily pitted against each other. Rather than being productive forces, workers are now destructive forces in a market context. It alienates and forces antagonism on humanity. The second is that through history and the German ideologies of the time of writing, capital has created a new division of labor in the state that exists outside of humanity, independent, yet only reinforces the upper class in the end. The bourgeoisie, thus, Prior revolution and new revolution will have to be class oriented and directed at another class, namely for the working class against the bourgeoisie. Revolutions of the past were class oriented, yet the new future revolutions will have to realize this in the act of revolution itself. The third is that every historical revolution hasn't contended with the mode of activity, of interaction and exchange. Thus, it hasn't been revolutionary in the context needed. Communism seeks to abolish the division of labor, create human conditions for all, and abolish class itself. The fourth is to reach this point to rid ourselves of capitalism, the division of labor, alienation via the labor process. Revolution is necessary, and it cannot happen without a complete structural change of society at large, interaction, the state, and commerce. This must happen in a universal, global context as well. On the process of revolution, Marx and Engels leaves us with this both for the production on a mass scale of this communist consciousness and for the success of the cause itself, the alteration of men on a mass scale is necessary, an alteration which only can take place in a practical movement, a revolution. This revolution is necessary, therefore, not only because the ruling class cannot be overthrown in any other way, but also because the class overthrowing it can only in a revolution succeed in ridding itself of all the muck of the ages and become fitted to found society anew. Thank you all so much for watching. The German ideology is pretty essential as to understand the placement of Marxism within the philosophical history at large. As always, these videos take an absolutely huge amount of time to make, and with YouTube's pretty terrible pay rate, Patreon is absolutely necessary for this channel's survival. Pledging a couple bucks a month would ensure we can keep this channel moving forward in the near future. I offer early access, complete VOD form of our live streams, editing tutorials, and exclusive content, so hopefully I can give back as much as possible. Another good way to help is bookmarking our Amazon link and using it in all your purchases. It gives us just a small percentage for free and helps a ton. You can find this link in the description below. But before we go, I, of course, have to give a special shout out to Jose David Guevara for the large pledge. As always, thank you so much. You genuinely help out immensely. Along with everyone else, thanks so much for the support, and hopefully we can see you in the next one.